the Southern legal system became an instrument of intimidation. Louisiana, Texas, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Florida passed laws that virtually prohibited freedmen from any work except as field hands. The laws were called Black Codes. The aim was slavery without the chain. The Black Codes were laws passed to control and restrict and constrain the lives of the freed people, essentially rendering them bondsmen again under law. Some states made it illegal for freedmen to handle weapons and restricted them from buying or renting land. Black children could be seized from poor families and forced to work in the fields. If a black man had no job, he could be jailed and auctioned to a planter for his labor. They make a travesty of the freedom that African Americans have acquired. They are so far from any notion of fairness or freedom that even Northerners who are not egalitarians say these laws are unacceptable. And so Northern Republicans are faced with a dilemma. They don't want to have a big fight with the president, but to accept the idea that Johnson's policy is a success and accept the black codes, they feel means giving up the victory in the Civil War. To Louisiana's black veterans, one freedman offered this advice. I would say to every colored soldier, bring your gun home. In December 1865, the 39th Congress, the first since the end of the Civil War, convened in Washington. More than 60 former Confederates prepared to take their seats, including four generals, four colonels, and six Confederate cabinet officers. Even Alexander H. Stevens, the former vice president of the Confederacy, expecting, as one observer put it, to govern the country he had been trying to destroy. If the South was going to rise again, so to speak, control its own political life, control the freed people, indeed, if ex-Confederates themselves were going to be allowed back into leadership at the national level, then to so many white Northerns it seemed like the war would have been fought in vain. On the opening day, the clerk of the House refused to announce the names of the Southern delegates in his roll call. The former Confederates were denied their elected seats and sent packing. The fight for control of Reconstruction had begun. In many ways, Congress was a poisoned atmosphere in the debates over the Reconstruction policy. There were raw war memories being played out. There were visceral hatreds being played out on the floor of Congress between Republicans and Democrats. These debates are between men who have experienced this war, who have fought this war. They are fighting literally about the meaning of that conflict they have just fought. Northern Democrats sided with Johnson and railed against Republicans across the aisle. Washington must get out of the way, they insisted, and let Southerners run their own affairs. The Democrats had always identified themselves as the party of the white man. They very explicitly said, we are here to protect the rights of white men, North and South. And how do we do that? We hold the Union together. For that reason, the Democrats saw themselves as trying to put North and South together as quickly as possible during the Civil War, and as soon as it's over, trying to knit North and South together at the expense of black men. At 
one point in the debates, Thaddeus Stevens stood up and answering his Democratic colleagues says, do not, I pray you, admit those who have slaughtered half a million of our countrymen until their clothes are dried and until they are reclad. I do not wish to sit side by side with men whose garments smell of the blood of my kindred. It was Stephen's way of saying, we're gonna keep the South out of the Union as long as we can, and we're not gonna allow anybody back in here who was responsible for making the war. A Congressional Committee on Reconstruction concluded that Southern governments were unable to keep law and order or stem violence against African Americans. Allowing Southern states unchecked power so soon after the war the committee said, was madness and lunacy. Moderate Republicans had hoped to persuade Johnson to provide minimal protections for blacks in the South. Now, even they were growing impatient with the president's policies. In March 1866, both houses of Congress passed a landmark civil rights bill that protected the rights of American citizens without regard to race. Republicans warned Johnson not to veto the bill if he hoped for any continued cooperation with Congress. Two weeks later, Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Bill. Johnson is opposed to the granting of those types of protections to black people. This had not been done for the white immigrants who had come to America. Why then are you doing it for these black people? Moderate Republicans were outraged. Johnson was stubborn, self-righteous, rigid in thinking. He was really the worst person possible to become president accidentally at a time when flexibility, vision, and creative leadership were really what was required. Moderate Republicans are forced into the radical camp because they had to oppose Andrew Johnson. Johnson's plan of reconstruction was so lenient, in utter contempt of black liberty, that was simply unacceptable. A united Republican Party overrode Johnson's veto. America had its first Civil Rights Act. But many in Congress argued that the act was not enough, that safeguarding civil rights required changes to the Constitution itself. Republican leaders proposed a new amendment the 14th Amendment becomes the crux of the political battle in 1866. And basically, what they put into the Constitution is a new definition of American nationality and citizenship, making African Americans for the first time full citizens of the United States. This is the origin of the concept of civil rights in American society rights which obtain to you as a citizen which cannot be rescinded because of your race. This is a titanic debate about just what the authority of the federal government is going to be. There were plenty of Americans who argued the federal government had no right to declare black people citizens. The Democrats are constantly putting forward racist arguments. You are eradicating a line between black and white which has existed forever. To Republicans, what's at stake here really is the definition of freedom. If a person can be discriminated against in every walk of life because of their race, has slavery really been abolished? Congress overwhelmingly passed the 14th Amendment, but it had to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. The president denounced the amendment and accused the Republicans of treason. 
Johnson is opposed to an expansion of federal power. For him, constitutional authority resides at the state level, not at the national level. And Johnson believes that the Republicans are engaged in an enormous usurpation of state authority. The lines were drawn. 